You have arrived at the Who Are We podcast. This is R.P. Watts. Thank you for being here. Today, February 25th, 2021, Intersection, Bliss, and a New Modern Hero. A story of defeating a truly terrifying enemy, yourself. You can find this post online at whoarewe.blog. Bliss, the new movie starring Salma Hayek and Owen Wilson on Amazon Prime, is a very human, otherworldly delve into the human psyche. Greg Whittle, played by Wilson, suffers from an unspecified mental illness and has recently gone through a divorce. Now, he's about to get fired. This marks the doorway to Whittle's psychological break. Or does it? The movie presents two versions of reality. In the first, the dystopian, Whittle is divorced, fired from his job, medicated, and avoiding his family. In the second, the utopian, he is married to a beautiful woman, lives in a paradise as a successful doctor. The world is at his disposal. Through the movie's course, the viewer is urged to go back and forth between which world is the real world. In the depressive version of his life, it appears that Whittle is using drugs to escape. In the blissful version, he is submerged into the depressive life via science and technology to provide perspective and gratitude for his perfect life. As he travels between the two, both realities try to convince him of their authenticity. And herein lies the experience. Critics of the movie cite the vagueness of the explanation of the experiences as a negative. I would argue that vagueness is a storytelling device. The vagueness expresses the sometimes disconnected nature of our conscious experience. Wilson believes, quote, it's about making the right choice, about finding something meaningful in your life to believe in. Human behavior. The movie begins with the main character, Greg Whittle, expositing, I have a picture in my head of a place, home, a woman. I don't know if any of it is real, but it has a feeling, and the feeling is real. This thought illustrates the experience of our true desires and dreams being just out of reach, almost explainable, yet still only a feeling. At times, we're drawn down a path and don't understand why. Author Robert Greene tells us that the parts of the brain that process cognition and emotion are in two different and disconnected areas. For example, when we become angry, we can't be sure of the real reason. Researchers have found that trusting your gut is more than just a saying. More than 90% of the serotonin produced in the body is produced in your gut. Serotonin controls mood, among other important functions. The gut is part of the enteric nervous system. This system works in the background of our consciousness and controls motivation and influences wisdom. The vagus nerve appears to have a great deal to do with well-being. The vagus nerve is activated by serotonin produced in the gut. The most closely related scientific term for gut feelings is interoception. Interoception is the capability of sensing psychological, excuse me, physiological stimuli from inside the body. Examples include heart rate, temperature, hunger, pain, and irritable bowel. Interoception is the first response your mind gets when making an emotional decision. While its main purpose is to regulate these physiological functions, recent findings on the relationship between emotional well-being and the gut suggest a much larger impact on emotional well-being than initially thought. Green posits that humans can't possess the exact understanding of why we do what we do. Much of this behavior is directed from the subconscious. I believe that Whittle's emotionally based True desires are illustrated in this initial exposition. The board is set. The destination is a fantasy. But the feeling is real. This is an experience many of us share. Human behavior. The movie begins with the main character, Greg Whittle, expositing, I have a picture in my head of a place. Home. A woman. I don't know if any of it is real, but it has a feeling. And the feeling is real. This thought illustrates the experience of our true desires and dreams being just out of reach, almost explainable, yet still only a feeling. At times, we're drawn down a path and don't understand why. Author Robert Greene 
tells us that the parts of the brain that process cognition and emotion are in two different and disconnected areas. For example, when we become angry, we can't be sure of the real reason. Researchers have found that trusting your gut is more than just a saying. More than 90% of the serotonin produced in the body is produced in your gut. Serotonin controls mood, among other important functions. The gut is part of the enteric nervous system. This system works in the background of our consciousness and controls motivation and influences wisdom. The vagus nerve appears to have a great deal to do with well-being. The vagus nerve is activated by serotonin produced in the gut. The most closely related scientific term for gut feelings is interoception. Interoception is the capability of sensing psychological, excuse me, physiological stimuli from inside the body. Examples include heart rate, temperature, hunger, pain, and irritable bowel. Interoception is the first response your mind gets when making an emotional decision. While its main purpose is to regulate these physiological functions, recent findings on the relationship between emotional well-being and the gut suggest a much larger impact on emotional well-being than initially thought. Green posits that humans can't possess the exact understanding of why we do what we do. Much of this behavior is directed from the subconscious. I believe that Whittle's emotionally based true desires are illustrated in this initial exposition. The board is set. The destination is a fantasy. But the feeling is real. This is an experience many of us share. Addiction Bliss indirectly points to addiction as a key driver of Whittle's experience. Taking the last pill from a prescription bottle, he calls immediately for a refill. He's confused about why he doesn't have another refill available. At the same time, he avoids his boss's incessant calls. He's distressed by their impending encounter. Whittle briefly looks out the window of his office, across the street, considering the site of a rehab center. The psychological process of addiction can be illustrated by the excessive appetites model. As we grow up, we are exposed to more choices and activities and behaviors. We experience things that give us pleasure or euphoria, as well as other unpleasant things. We find that some of these behaviors or habits have a positive influence on our mood. We'll tend to lean on mood-enhancing activities, especially when there's trauma or other causes of decreased mood. Much of this impact comes from our family and social network. As we learn what gives us pleasure or escape, when stress arises, we commit to the behaviors that allow the desired effects. Addiction can be biological, but it's strongly based in our psychology. Genetically, we can be predisposed to addiction, but no personality will predict addictive behaviors. An estimated 21 million Americans have an addiction. And the 20% of Americans with depression or anxiety also have an addiction. The problem continues to grow. Drug overdose deaths have more than tripled since 1990. Additionally, behavioral addictions are prevalent in society as well. Gambling addiction, sex addiction, exercise, and work addiction, these are all examples of behavioral addictions. They follow the same reward pathways in the brain that provide pleasure, euphoria, or relief. In the case of Bliss, it's suggested that Whittle's life is racked with the consequences of his addiction. Mental health. The nervous breakdown. This potentially overused cliched phrase, not used diagnostically, is described as, quote, a period of intense mental distress. Often, this is associated with hallucinations, insomnia, paranoia, and extreme mood swings. Modernly, we refer to what Greg Whittle experiences in Bliss as a psychotic episode. While a psychotic episode is a symptom of schizophrenia, it is not as uncommon as one would think. Between 5 and 10% of the population will have a psychotic episode in the course of their lifetime. In many instances, the the event is short-lived. Depression, anxiety, and social withdrawal are many of the warning signs of a psychotic episode. Although varying in extremity, one in five adults in the U.S. lives with a mental illness. Recent data reports that depression among youth is a growing problem. The COVID-19 pandemic has only enhanced this trend, quadrupling the number of adults reporting depression than the year prior. 
The experience of Greg Whittle and Bliss is not as uncommon and far-fetched as many think. So what is real? Spoiler alert here. The movie concludes with Whittle entering the rehab facility across the street from his former employer. Parallel to the first scene, Whittle exposits the final scene. He holds a picture of his daughter and says, This woman says she's my daughter. And I believe her. In the version of reality where Whittle is a drug addict, divorced and lost, his daughter Emily refuses to give up on him. This is the woman in the picture. This suggests that this dystopian world is the real world. This would mean that Whittle really is so confused and he can't truly remember. This also suggests that he isn't sure which version is real. But what is clear is that he has chosen the more dystopian of the two realities. Ramzi Najjar, the author of The You Beyond You, claims, Our thinking process is like a Lego game where we can associate, disassociate, reassociate, or fully dismantle what has already been built inside and model it into something completely new. Najjar conceptualizes our perception of the world as a result of a chaotic process of processing, an infinite amount of information constantly being ingested by our minds. Dreaming is a process always happening just below the surface. It is important to derive a way to organize and filter the insurmountable volume of information taken in by our senses. However, we did not evolve to see the world as it is. We see what we need to see to survive. Psychologist Donald Hoffman posits that this perceptive alteration of reality provides human beings with the ability to assign value to perceptive elements. When I see tables and chairs and the sun and the moon and so forth, that I'm seeing reality as it is. No one believes we see all of reality, of course. We only see the parts that we need to see. Uh, but that the parts that we do see, we're seeing truthfully. And so I've looked at that from the point of view of the mathematics of evolution, the evolutionary game theory. And we can actually run simulations to see what happens, and we can prove theorems. And we've, we've done both. And the bottom line is that the probability... If our senses evolved and were shaped by natural selection, the probability that we see reality as it is, is zero. And that, that means not simply that I, you know, I don't quite see the shape of a chair correctly or I don't quite see the colors correctly. It's, it's much deeper than that. The problem is that the very language of space and time and physical objects is the wrong language. An apple is food. The visual experience of seeing an apple is how we process the data of this type of food. When we look away, there is no sign of the apple in our perception. Hoffman refers to this as a fitness payoff, a compact and easy-to-use perception of what is. He refers to the theory in, at a whole, in a whole as an interface theory. The gray area implied in both Nishar's book and Hoffman's theory is that there's a tremendous amount of influence on the perception of our reality. With much of this influence, we can learn to direct. For example, if you're tired, you'll perceive distances as further than if you weren't. Body awareness can be useful in decreasing anxiety in high-stress situations. Hedge fund managers who could more accurately count their heartbeats without touching their bodies were more likely to make accurate stock predictions. And so we don't know for sure what is real. Although most of our perceptions overlap enough to generally understand one another, emphasis on the generally, the experience of psychosis does not exist in this overlap. Does psychosis serve a purpose? To be clear, psychosis is a symptom, not an illness itself. It impacts how the brain processes information, and the victim of and the victim of psychosis may see, hear, or believe things that aren't real. It is commonly associated with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, but why does it happen? A recent study describes a relationship between psychosis and stressors, mainly those involving social interactions. This hyperconsciousness is stirred due to the evolved need for social acceptance, calling on their mind's ability to enhance social adaptation. Further, psychosis is the function on overdrive due to various sensitivities one may have in their psychology or brain physiology. 
The event of hearing, seeing, or believing, and the increase in significance of details and things, may be the imagination attempting to drive the change necessary to attain social acceptance. This is further supported by the notion that the most psychotic episodes occur during adolescence when the need for social acceptance is great. In Whittle's case, this, the dystopian reality in which he is divorced, a social threat, fired, also a social threat, and isolated, he begins to experience psychosis. Again, it is implied this is set off by the drugs he was prescribed. He embarks on a journey to get drugs from somewhere other than the pharmacy. This is where he meets Isabel, his homeless drug-doing partner in crime, who convinces him that nothing in the world is real. In the utopian version of life, Whittle can feel there's something wrong. Isabel's Isabel's colleagues suggest that her work with the technology of delving into a life of suffering to create gratitude has, quote, problems. Also, he is called back to the dystopian reality by a ghostly image of his daughter, who pleads with him to return. In this framework, the triggers of getting fired, divorced, and the drugs may have created a psychosis that helped Whittle accept and gain social and personal connections that he so desired. In this way, the story is of a man surmounting a crucible, a rite of passage. This is the hero's journey. An unlikely hero. Joseph Campbell wrote of the hero's journey. This idea outlines the elements of a story's main character arc. Simply, there are three stages, broken down into 12 events. Many of them apply here. Act 1 is the separation. Act 2, the descent and initiation. And finally, 3, the return. In Act 1, Will is shown as separated, fired, divorced, and avoided. He descends into the underworld with Isabel and a new version of reality that changes him is introduced. He's initiated. The first act takes place in an ordinary world, but the second in what Campbell called the special world. Young wrote of these ideas in his work, Symbols of Transformation. He describes the journey as the attempt to free ego consciousness from the deadly grip of the unconscious. This period is often referred to as the dark night of the soul, Historically, the consciousness has been a deadly beast or a wicked witch. In the case of bliss, it truly is the unconscious, which is the source of the ordeal. The ordeal, the obstacle to be overcome, is Whittle's choice of life. Which set of values and beliefs will he hold on to and bind to his character? What will drive him to do so? Many times during the movie, I found myself cheering for the utopian side. It was his dream, his fantasy, and he was happy on the surface. But in the end, he couldn't bear himself being disconnected from his daughter. And so, he faced the humiliation, the uncertainty, and made his choice. In the end, he was drawn back to the people whom he loved and who loved him. An unlikely hero exists in the movie's finality, but a culturally relevant one. Whittle has been through the crucible, He's been given a glimpse of heaven and chooses to come back and face his life, to do the work. In an age where culture, technology, and the rate of change is in flux at exponential rates, many of us are on this hero's journey with our own mental health. This movie stands as a great emblem of this journey. What did you think of Bliss? Thank you for listening. This is R.P. Watts. You can find us online at whoarewe.blog. This has been a presentation of Intersection, Bliss, and a New Modern Hero. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe to this feed.